So a lot of things have happened in the last two years that have affected everyone around the world. And obviously, I'm not going to make a joke about, you know, coronavirus and the effects it's had. I mean, there are some very serious effects. There are economic effects. There have been life and death effects, and it absolutely is a serious subject. But since this is a channel dedicated to the toy industry, I want to talk a little bit about how the toy industry has been affected by the global pandemic and the shutdown of a lot of industries and, you know, the all of the economic issues, and relating directly to the adult collector trickling down to some of the frustration that we've felt about getting product. I'm not putting this in comparison to life and death, I'm just trying to show how the toy industry has been affected by COVID-19. So, obviously, there is the, you know, well, obviously there's the obvious with the whole, you know, shipping and port issue where a product is having a harder time getting to store because of that, but there are also problems with, you know, items not even getting tested correctly, like, you know, the good old Yoda, baby Yoda hand sanitizer that contained poison. I mean, that's always fun too, right? And a larger thing that has affected the toy industry in particular has been what's been going on with the movie industry, that a lot of films have gotten pushed out from their original release date because everything was closed. So these films, which had a toy line that was created three years, or at least work began three years prior to the movie being released, a lot of times couldn't stop. It was already being shipped to retail, sort of the train had already left the station. And so product was showing up at retail for these movies when there was no movie to go see. And sometimes that is a direct path to the clearance aisle, unfortunately, because when there's no content out, it's hard for kids and new collectors to get into a pro property when, you know, they don't have any kind of, uh, well, you know, cognitive schema of what it is. So that's one thing. But there's also the playbook that the toy industry has, and that's what I really want to get into, because there's two lines in particular, and one of them being G.I. Joe Classified, which I know has been the source of a lot of frustration for toy collectors the last two years, and the other one being Masters of the Universe Origins. They both have very different stories. Now, I want to clear the, the table first off that people who think that I want one or either of these lines to fail, that is completely the wrong impression. When I make videos where I've talked about issues that these lines have had struggling, it's not, you know, an epic fail or the fact that I, you know, don't want to be a cheerleader creating an epic fail. It's that, well, I'm just trying to provide information. When I talk about these lines struggling at retail or why they may have issues, it has nothing to do with me not being, you know, a fan. I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan of He-Man. I think He-Man is the coolest, hence the t-shirt that I'm wearing that says that. So, I've even made videos, you know, about my wish list, in particular origins of figures I'd like to see. It's more that you know, if I, if you see a house burning down and you point out that a house is burning down, it doesn't make you anti-house. You're just reporting on what you're seeing. And a big part of this channel is from my experience being in the toy industry, which has not stopped. I'm still in the toy industry and consulting with toy companies. Well, I like to provide insight. And so let's do that for these two lines in particular. Why has G.I. Joe, the signature series line, I'm sorry, signature series, the classified series, and Masters of the Universe Origins had some bumps in the road in 2019 and 2020. And there are some things that are tied into everything happening with the global pandemic and shutdown, but there are also things that are more about toy industry playbooks and strategies they take. I've talked about how both of these lines are essentially um, orphan lines, meaning they haven't been connected to a larger planogram. And that's a big part of the problem of why people have trouble finding them. Because when you're not attached to a planogram, when you're an orphan skew, and you only have one peg, it's really hard to not only shop the, this item, but it's also hard for retailers to skew it. And there are reasons why toys wind up being orphan skews with one peg instead of a solid strip that is, you know, one foot, two foot, all the way to six or eight feet but going from top to bottom, not just single items hanging sort of in the middle of the air, if you will. Like, you know, in other words, it doesn't go all the way to the bottom. There's not large items like a Castle Grey Skull. I mean, I know Mojo Origins had one, but Target didn't take it. So it wound up, you know, if you look at all of the other lines, they all have nice even strips with, you know, less expensive items at the top, 
more expensive items on the bottom, but that's all part of the same brand. And sometimes the, you know, the footage increases two feet, three feet, four feet, but 99% of SKUs at retail don't have that one single item that's just sort of floating there in the middle of the aisle. And that is why it's really hard to, for basically merchandise these items, and even for the stocking people, the people who put it out, to put it there. But look what's happened now. Both of these lines, G.I. Joe and Masters of the Universe, now have full planograms. Granted, they're not six feet, they're more like, you know, two or three feet, but you can see that they have items that go all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom, from the middle shelf to the bottom shelf. So, that's where it comes into looking at the toy industry playlist and the different strategies that the toy industry uses to get product to market. Now, again, there have been some effects from the, uh, you know, the whole global pandemic and shutdown, but basically, both of these lines were placeholders. They were not really intended to be the main part of a brand at retail. Masters of the Universe Origins was put out first at Walmart, because Walmart could handle the MOQ, the quota, but it was really about priming the pump getting people excited that there was new Masters of the Universe content coming a year later. And multiple shows have launched on Netflix, and there has been, you know, fan interest or lack thereof. So what this is, is it's kind of like staking a claim. It's like going out there and saying, my brand is now going to live at retail because big content is coming, so we should be part of the 20 feet. So it's because the toy industry is incredibly competitive. There's only 20 feet in that action figure aisle, 10 on one side, 10 on the other. So, you know, it's kind of like those people that lick the car window in the dealership because, or the car door because they want to claim it as their own so no one else will buy it. Well, it's kind of like that. That 20 feet in the aisle is a resource. It's basically an area where you can sell your product. And resources have been the source of essentially every major conflict in history that more or less we've ever had. It's usually always fought over resources. Greeks knew it. The Carthaginians knew it. Now you know it. So, by getting a brand out there in aisle, and this is something I've seen from my experience in the toy industry, I'm not just, you know, pulling this out of thin air, it's like staking a claim. So, once you can claim an area of the aisle, the idea is you can quickly grow that into a planogram. So even if you don't have everything at first, and it's easy to you know, blame that on things like what happened in 19 and 20 with the global shutdown, so the good SKUs will bubble up to the top, and the things that don't sell as well will drop off, but retail doesn't care. They just want to see one foot, two foot, three foot of product that is performing well. The SKUs that don't sell well can just be sort of swept under the rug and can be eliminated and replaced with better selling SKUs, but the planogram remains. So that's kind of what happened with Origins. It was a placeholder to claim a larger Motu segment. With G.I. Joe Classified, well, it was much more about a waiting game. So they always intended to have one to two feet of planogram space and have a full retail set. But getting into the retail aisle, even for an established brand like G.I. Joe, the door is usually always locked. When it opens up is when you have a movie. And movies tend to open up brands that normally don't get merchandise to suddenly be sold in the toy aisle, and retailers are willing to take a chance on them. And that's what happened with the G.I. Joe Classified series. It was part of the Snake Eyes movie retail planogram, as you could see from, well, go to retail right now, and you can see that in aisle. I have experience doing this when I worked on the Green Lantern movie line at Mattel. So when you have a, uh, a movie line, you get what's called incremental space, additional space. There's a welcome mat for a brand that might not normally hang at retail, but suddenly a movie, retailers are like, oh yes, you know, here, have 10 feet of space, 2 feet of space, have pallets in the middle of the runway. We'd already been doing Green Lantern action figures as part of the comic book line, DCU Classic, but now with the movie it allowed the opportunity to have classic versions or sneak preview movie versions of Green Lantern, sort of uh, more collector-friendly characters. Exactly what's happening with G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe Classified is the collector-friendly, more obscure character, more classic version of Snake Eyes. 
that is meant to be adjunctive to the overall Snake Eyes planogram, essentially riding on the coattails of the movie. The movie opened up the ability to have G.I. Joe back in the aisle. And if you look, the very first G.I. Joe classified figure was Snake Eyes, launched a Comic-Con. It was meant to kick off the whole program that would flow directly into a Snake Eyes movie retail statement that would include classified, just like Green Lantern movie included Green Lantern classics. Same thing. But with the Snake Eyes movie getting pushed out, which was going to be, no pun intended, the vehicle to get all of this G.I. Joe product in aisle, including classified, well, the delay in the movie caused by 2019, 2020's, you know, global shutdown and, you know, the pandemic, this meant that anything that was a movie product had an embargo and couldn't ship. But Classified isn't part of the movie. It was based on classic G.I. Joe. So it could ship, and that's how it became an orphan skew. It sort of fell through the hole where, okay, tar you know, Target, Walmart, we can't ship you the Snake Eyes product, but we know that you allocated some space for G.I. Joe for Snake Eyes. What we can ship is the non-movie-related product. And that's exactly how it becomes an orphan skew. It becomes a single skew that was supposed to be part of a larger program. And this can be a big struggle. And when you're an orphan skew, it's much harder to find retail space. Now it's joined by all of the movie product, now that the movie's out. So you have the kid movie product, you have the collector movie product, and I don't just mean adult collector, kid collector too. And it could all hang together in a larger full retail planogram that goes top down from impulse buy all the way down to the bottom shelf, which is sort of your under the tree or big birthday gift. So you can see there's, you know, a good, what, two feet of product for Snake Eyes. You know, I mean, it's not a huge part of the aisle, but it is fully there. And it's no longer one single skew hanging as an orphan skew because it was the only thing available to ship with the movie pushed out. I mean, a small house and a small home in the aisle is better than no home at all. And those are the reasons why lines like Origins and Classified have been so hard to find. It's been related to industry playbooks and what's been happening in 2019 and 2020. I hope this video was insightful, and if you have further questions or want uh, more information about this, leave it in the comments below. I can always do a follow-up. Thanks for watching, sharing, subscribing, and uh, I'll see you guys at the next video.